you have chosen to look at this video and appreciate you doing that. Pray that it might be helpful to you and uh, a blessing to you. This passage of scripture is a blessing to me and I uh, hope this parable uh, will be meaningful. Thank you too for those of you that come regularly for your faithfulness. These are unusual times where we have to do things in unusual ways and uh, grateful for technology where we might be able to still communicate not only with our local church body but the church body around the world. So uh, just know that we love you and appreciate you. Uh, one of the ways we can show that is that if you are listening now and you don't have a Bible or you would like a Bible, uh, you can email us through uh, the church website there on YouTube and uh, we would love to send you a, a Bible. Um, if you have questions about what it means to be a Christian, we'd also like to send you some information about that. And so uh, please just email us through our website and uh, we would love to get in contact with you and send you those things. We are going to begin with a few verses out of Psalm 106 uh, before we have a time of musical meditation and then a prayer time. Psalm 106, first uh, five verses. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare his praise? Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them, that I may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Well, today we... Um, want to lift up in prayer our churches. Um, in our particular church, we want to pray for Sarah uh, as she's going through cancer treatments. We want to pray for Ann, who's also going through treatments. We want to pray for Sherry, who's recovering from surgery yesterday and will begin treatments. Uh, we want to pray for the Ayers family, who lost a dear loved one uh, yesterday and uh, pray for a grieving husband and a grieving sister at this time. We want to pray for the nations of the world and those in those nations um, who have lost loved ones due to the pandemic. We want to pray for Lebanon and the tragedy in Beirut and those who've lost uh, loved ones in that explosion. And we want to pray for our missionaries from the church who are serving in Beirut and serving the nations of the world and just lift them up and pray for strength at this time in their lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
We thank you, Father, that we have a holy God we can come to and speak with and listen to our Creator. We thank you that you have provided us this day of life and pray that we might make the most of this day for your glory and for your purposes. We thank you that we can intercede on behalf of uh, those who are going through various trials and ask you, Father, to bring comfort and peace uh, to those who are grieving, to those who are sick, bring healing. Uh, and Lord, we thank you that we can trust you to do that. We lift up Sarah today and Ann and Sherry. We lift up the Ayers family and their loss. We pray, Lord, for our missionaries who are dealing with tragedies around the world, the explosion in Beirut, Lebanon, loss of life, loss of property. <clears throat> we pray for the nations of the world still struggling with the pandemic. We pray for the United States and the um, our government as decisions are made that affect millions of people, that you would intervene where inappropriate decisions are being made, that you would intervene where no decisions are being made. Lord, that you would do your work to protect your people. We pray too, Lord, that this lesson that's been ordained by you in this pandemic, that we might learn what you have for us to learn. We pray not only for our national leaders, but our local leaders, Lord, our church leaders, as we have to make decisions that affect many people. Give us your wisdom. And Lord, we rejoice at the gift of your Son, who brings salvation to us and the offer of salvation to all. We pray, O oh Lord, that the gospel might prevail uh, through bright times and dark times for your glory and for our good. In the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. We're going to look at, I'm not going to read the passage ahead of time. We're going to look at this passage um, as uh, as we walk through what it's saying, uh, it lends itself to that particular verse by verse uh, reading and explanation. It's in Matthew chapter 20 is the parable that we are looking at today. And if you have a Bible with you, I encourage you to uh, pick it up, turn to Matthew 20, and hopefully uh, you can follow along with this. This parable actually answers a question that we have at the end of chapter 19. So there's some verses there I will read at the end of chapter 19, beginning at verse 27 of the Gospel of Matthew. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you will have followed me, you who have followed me, will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So the parable that follows that is what's called laborers in the vineyard, and that's what we're going to look at today, but it answers uh, Peter's question there. In this parable, we see that the master is Christ. 
that all the laborers in the vineyard are the truly converted believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those people that we looked at in other parables, like back in chapter 13 uh, or in Mark chapter 4, those who receive the good seed of the word, um, they're the wheat, not the weeds. Uh, the ones who found the treasure and, uh, in the field and the one that discovered the pearl of great price. Those are the laborers that we see in this particular uh, parable today in chapter 20. <clears throat> Charles Spurgeon said about this, The kingdom of heaven is all of grace, and so is the service connected with it. Let this be remembered in the exposition of this parable. The call to work, the ability, and the reward are all on the principle of grace and not upon that of merit. And so we uh, look at the laborers in this picture in verses 1 and 2. Uh, for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Well, we see that that's early in the morning. It's a privilege to begin uh, your service to the master, to the Lord Jesus, so early. They agreed to the terms. And they went to work. The terms were, were a, a denarius a day. It's a day wage. That's normal for in the first century. Notice one thing, though, here. Hiring begins with the householder, the master of the house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers. Hiring begins with the householder. The initiative is with him. All the work of God begins with God. It doesn't begin with us. It doesn't begin with our work. No, it begins with God. God's initial intrusion in our lives is just that, an intrusion in our lives. The initiative begins with the Lord. If anyone has the will to serve, to serve the Lord, uh, it is because... God's will working in them first. That's what we see in those first two verses. And then verses 3 and 4. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So that this, these verses say he saw some idle. He hired more workers. For the third hour, you see that going, going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle. He hired more about the third hour. He hired them for three quarters of a day's work. These are like the people whose childhood has passed. But they're not yet old. They have no deal like the first. He didn't promise them a, a denarius for, uh, for their work. He just said, whatever it seems right, I will give you. Uh, oh, if you who had passed your youth already like these would just take up the tools and serve God, would you do that? And then verse 5. So they went, going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same thing. The day was half gone. That represents middle-aged men and women who are called by the grace of God. And then later he went out, those who are seven, eighty, ninety, the Lord calls a number of those by his gift of grace. Calls people throughout their lives. And God in his grace and mercy and love calls into the kingdom work those who've 
long lost the years of youth, like me, for instance, closing in on the end of their lives, and he receives them for service. He still does. He has a, a work for the weak, as well as a work for the strong. He doesn't allow people to serve him without the gift of grace, even though they've spent their best days living in sin. If you procrastinated in giving your life to the, listen to me, if you've procrastinated in giving your life to the Lord, this parable should encourage you to seek the Lord. And then in verses 6 and 7 we read, And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. Why do you stand here idle all day? <laughs> As a pastor, you do not know how many times I want to ask that question. Why do you stand here idle not serving the Lord? Listen, your, your idleness is a reflection of your relationship with God. And whether He has called you into service by His grace... Therefore, for you, it may be the very last hour. And so you serve him that last hour, the one who gave his life to you. It's time for you who are close to the end of your lives. Listen to him. This is important. Those of you that are close to the end of your lives to get the work. Think of that other parable, to kill the weeds. Prune the vines. Do something for the Lord in His kingdom. It's time. He invites you as surely as invited those early in the morning. And you will get your reward. And then we see the groups uh, here. Is, it's pay time. We look at verse Time for their pay in verse 8. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. The day ends. It's time for them to be paid. Paying at the end of the day was normal in those times. Once our day is over, we will be required. We will be called to receive our reward. But the payment's strange here. Just as strange as the hiring itself. He, he chose so that those who were called first would be served last. And the only reason here is so that those who were first and worked the entire day would notice the display of God's free grace to those who had not worked a full day. In the transaction of His grace, we see the sovereignty of God as well as His goodness. Verse 9, And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Look at that. Those who just worked a couple of hours, received a day's wage. The Lord's pay is not based on what we deserve. If that was the case, we wouldn't be paid at all. It's based purely on grace, the gift of God's immense bounty to His people. He pays on the grace scale, not on the merit scale. Everybody got a day's wage. And so we see the incredible goodness and, and, and grace of the Lord in the vineyard. Some who have excelled and, and served for many years in the church and, and, and those who have served just a, a, a brief time have blessed lives that they can attest to. 
And they've received the fullness of God's grace. God will place in, in, in heavenly glory those who turn to Christ even at the last moment. What did he say to that dying thief on the cross right next to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, the riches of the grace of God. Verse 10 we read, Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. God's not obligated to act in the way that you or I think He should act. Because God acts perfectly and God acts justly and it's hard for us to see that through our sinful eyes. Those full day workers were standing there waiting, thinking about their pay and how hard they worked. And they rebelled at the perfect sovereignty of grace. Charles Spurgeon said, Those who are not friends of, to any attribute of God are in, not in love with the others. You get that? If there's just one attribute of God that you're not friends with, you're not in love with the others as well. So if they rebel at God's sovereignty, they'll soon resist God's justice. They had their promise, like you and I have our promise from God. What more could they ask for? And then verse 11 and 12 and on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Grumbling begins right away. Grumbling's a good word that's used throughout Scripture, and we still do it today, even in the church. And the only supposed fault they could find with God was that he was too good to the others who had served less time. God does not measure service like we do. He has his own gracious ways of measuring and it's not by sweat or by hours. His grace is not based on law. The grumbling was because, not that they had been lowered in value, their grumbling was because God raised the others up in value. He used his own money, and he'll dispense it his way, however he chooses. He is God, and what he does is for his glory. Had they... Uh, have been of the right mind, they should have rejoiced with the others who got a day's pay. So what do we see in his response? Verse 13 in the first part of 14. But he replied to one of them, Friend, just one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Do you not agree with me? Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. He didn't have to argue with all of them. He just answered one. I did you no wrong. If the Lord rewards only by grace and not merit, then we're not wronged when someone is blessed for less work. But that legal, prideful spirit will come into all of us. Like the older brother, for instance, in the parable of the prodigal son. Or even Peter's question there in chapter 19, verse 27, when we saw earlier, then Peter said in reply, See, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? None of us is free of the proud spirit, no matter how... Uh, unlovely and unreasonable 
it is. So God is fair and just with all. That's his response. Uh, second thing with his response, if God treats no one unfairly, then he deals with many more, far more leniently than we deserve. Verses 14 and 15. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? The master of the house will not be swayed from his liberal gifts of grace. What he gives is his own, and that's what sovereignty does. That's what sovereignty is. He has the right to do with what he pleases. And when he does it, is always right and always perfect, no matter how it looks to us. The Lord is not going to be ruled by your regulations or my regulations. If mercy belongs to the Lord, he may give it as he pleases. If reward for service is a pure act of grace, he gives it according to his good pleasure. He, sa he says in Scripture, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Do you begrudge my generosity, he says? Do you resent my generosity? Do you envy my generosity? Because I am good to those who deserve so little. Does this leave you out of what I promised you? Never ever envy those who come to the Lord late in life and never undervalue their usefulness for the kingdom. That is so important. Never envy those who come to the Lord late in life, and never undervalue their usefulness for kingdom work. Rejoice at the sovereignty which blesses them so richly. We share mercy with them, so we should also share our joy with them. Then the third thing we see, we see God is fair and just with all. If God treats no one unfairly, then he deals with many far more leniently than we deserve. And then lastly, God's perspective is all true disciples are equal in his eyes. Verse 16. So, the last will be first and the first last. He frames this entire parable with that same sentence. He ends chapter 19 with, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. And he ends the parable with, so the last will be first, and the first last. He framed it that way. And teaching us that that precedence in the kingdom is by the order of grace and not by the sense of rightness or justice. As he is king, he has the right to rule and he cannot do wrong. All who are truly saved are equally precious in the Lord's sight and equally rewarded with Eternal joy in the presence of Christ and all the redeemed gathered there. Jesus has now finished his answer to Peter's question there. What then do we have? What will we be left with? Just some closing points I'd like to make. First of all, God initiates salvation sovereignly. You see that throughout the whole parable. He came into the marketplace. He selected those he wanted to come and serve in the kingdom. Jesus said that to the apostles in John chapter 15. You have not chosen me. Why? I have chosen you. God initiates salvation sovereignly. Secondly, God establishes the terms. He set the terms and they agreed to the terms. 
They came on his terms. The terms of the gospel have been established. God set the terms of the gospel. You come to him on the basis of his terms. Thirdly, we see God is continually calling people into the kingdom. That's a glorious thing, isn't it? When you study this parable, there was, there was a beginning during the day and there will be an end during the day and his work is continuous. The work of redemption goes on and on and on and on. Uh, he's continually doing, going into the marketplace of, of humanity and selecting those he wants to come and work. And the fourth truth we see in this passage is God redeems those who are willing. Now, hear me out. They answered the call. That's the other side of his sovereign choice. They were there. They were available. They were willing. They knew they were dependent. They had nothing apart from this. They were not rich. They needed work. They were not satisfied. They were poor uh, and meek and they were the beggars and those without the resources who would take whatever the master would give. And he called them and they stepped forward. Number five, God is particularly compassionate to those who have no resources. When you think about the fact that there are many noble and there are many mighty, God could have sovereignly done anything that he wanted. Why them? Well, God, we see throughout Scripture, God has this unusual compassion for those in deep need, particularly the poor, the sick. That's something the church needs to wake up to. Number six, all, all who came into the vineyard worked. There were no deadbeats. There were no freeloaders. There weren't two people working and four people supervising. And what is the work? What is the work today? Well, they were harvesting. The harvest today is evangelism. That's the work, isn't it? That's the only work we do here, really, we can't do in heaven. It's the only thing. I mean, we're going to praise in heaven. We're going to worship in heaven. We're going to live those holy lives in heaven. We're going to fellowship in heaven. Oh, won't that fellowship be like crazy in heaven? When we're all perfect, we won't have to confront anything. We'll just enjoy. But we won't evangelize in heaven. That's the work today. The harvest is plentiful. And everybody does it. Everybody in the vineyard does it. Everybody is called to work. We don't all work as well as we should. That's true. But the work is there. And if you're in the kingdom, you're about the work. And lastly, number seven, this is overwhelming. God gives all of us more than we deserve. Let me say it again. God gives all of us more than we deserve. You know the truth? Nobody in this parable got what they deserved. The people that worked one hour didn't deserve it. Neither did the people who worked 12 hours. There's really no argument here about the generosity of the landowner. God gives us more than we deserve. If you gave the Lord 60 years of service, would you deserve heaven? You wouldn't deserve it any more than the person who gave the Lord 15 minutes of service. It's all of grace. So then there's that one sort of overwhelming lesson that's humility and a sense of unworthiness. We didn't see that with those who worked the entire day. 
But humility and a sense of unworthiness is the only right attitude toward our sovereign, saving God. Humility and a sense of unworthiness is the only right attitude toward our sovereign, saving God. Give your life to Him today. It's never too late. Trust what Christ did on the cross for you today and serve Him with all your might, even if there are only five minutes left. Do it, because the end of the day is coming. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the teaching of Jesus. We thank you for those who are serving in the church even today because you have changed their lives. We pray, Lord, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you might change the lives of those listening to this video today. We thank you for your love, your care for us that precious gift of grace. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.